Thanks so much, Fiona. I forgot how much fun we had that day. It was absolutely amazing. Now that was brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, right, so I'll start. I'm not rich. I didn't win the genetic lottery and I lost most of my life to addiction. So why the hell am I so happy? And it's simple, because I focus on growth and progress. Every situation is an opportunity to grow if you focus on growth and progress. Am I talking about resilience here? Is that being resilient? For me, it's not. For me, it's being more than resilient. There's a good concept that I, I, I've come across recently. It's by a guy called Nassian Taleb, and it's known as anti-fragile. So what's, what's anti-fragile? Fragile means that you break under adversity. You struggle under stress, and you just really, you take hits and you don't cope. That's what being fragile means, you break. Being resilient means you still take the hits, but you're still, you're taking hits. You're coping with the hits, and that's great, that's brilliant. Being resilient is brilliant. But you're still taking those hits, and they wear you down over time. What anti-fragile means for me is that you take the hits, but you grow as a result. You focus on progress, and you get stronger through adversity. That's what anti-fragile means. An example of anti-fragile for me, a great example, comes from the mythical creature Hydra. Hydra was like a snake with lots of heads. It was a serpent creature with lots of heads. And when you chop off one head, two heads grow back. So that's what epitomizes anti-fragile. Your adversity hits you, but you get stronger as a result. I'll give you a couple of examples of this that I use in my own life. When I'm around, let's say, in a situation at work, or I'm around difficult people or negative people, and I can't get out of that situation, I focus on growth and progress. I might practice tolerance, acceptance, or practice my perspective-taking skills. Try to see the world from another person's point of view. Because you know, it's very, very hard not to be empathetic when you're standing in someone else's shoes. But what the focus is, is practicing on growth and progress. When a negative thought comes into my head, or if a negative thought comes into your head, just replace it with a positive one. So you're always focusing on growth. I used to hate waiting in queues, the cheek of it when you think about it. But I was, I was busy, so I didn't, I didn't like waiting in queues. But I don't wait in queues anymore. I meditate in queues. If I have a big failure, I learn how to do it better next time. And there's a great freedom in that. If I made a mess of this talk tonight, I just see where I went wrong and do the next one better because I'm focusing on growth and progress. That's the key piece here. There's a couple of instances in my own life where I had to focus on growth and progress and it worked out really, really well. Five and a half, about five years ago, um, I went back to college. And I had no money, I had no, finance, I had no way to finance myself. And I had to get a job um, doing deliveries. And it's a grand job doing deliveries. But I earned sort of decent money in my own life before that. So it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a humbling experience for me. So for three years, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday night, I earned six euro an hour for five hours. That was a lot of time every weekend for three years. And if any of you um, ever went to Camille, if any of you ever get orders from Camille? Yeah. yeah, the food is beautiful by the way, it really is. But a delivery driver in Camille, if you've ever gotten a delivery, you'll know they wear a pink dicky bow. So <laughs> as I was saying, it was a humbling experience. <laughs> but what, what happened to me in them three years was, I used to listen to podcasts in the car. I used to listen to books in the car, audio books, meditation books. And that's actually at the launch and the career that I have today. I learned more in them three years sitting in my car driving around than I did in college. And everything I talk about now stemmed from all of that, all of them audio books, all of that stuff that I learned in the car, just from focusing on growth and progress. Um, only a couple of months ago, um, as Fiona mentioned at the start, so I met Niall Breslin uh, last year, and we were going to be writing a book together. And I was really excited for the book, it was going great. And we were just about to get, get writing and I signed the contracts and all. And all of a sudden the book, the book deal fell through. Through no fault of, of anyone, just life got in the way, this is what happens. And I remember thinking, oh God, that was, that was something I was really looking forward to do. But I just focused on the positives, I didn't focus on the negatives. And I remember Niall Breslin actually opened up loads of doors for me and he's still opening doors for me today. But if I sort to got annoyed or got head up in that kind of stuff, I, I could have ruined any potential opportunities in the future. 
But that I just looked at the good side of that, looked at the positive side of that, and amazing things have come from that. I got my own book deal, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. And if any is now Niall Breslin as well, you'll know um, he's six foot eight. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I often used to think of what I'd be like at the book launch. It'd be like something like Lord, Lord, Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> Fro, Frodo and uh, Gandalf standing there. So I'm taking the positives out of everything, and it's a great way to live. It really is. But um, the, the, most, um, the most negative uh, thing ever to ha happened in my life, and the most difficult thing I've ever faced, happened um, five and a half years ago. The picture on the right there is a picture of me in 2011. Two years before I hit rock bottom from chronic heroin addiction. I was a heroin addict for 15 years. 12 of them years, I was a registered addict, going to a clinic, giving urine samples, going to the chemist nearly every day, collecting methadone. And yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a good time. But just so you guys can relate to this as well, because people have struggled to relate to a heroin addict. Drugs were not my problem. Heroin was not my problem. My problem was anxiety and overthinking. I was consumed by anxiety and tormented by my mind. That's what my problem was. And it just might be able to relate to you a little bit better. Another thing as well was, I actually functioned very, very well for most of that time. Well, I, did, I didn't actually function very well. I thought I functioned very well. <laughs> I know, I usually say that, there's a lot of people in this audience, I'm looking at Wayne right there. <laughs> I definitely didn't function very well. I thought, I thought I did. But I kept my job for a lot of that time. I, I functioned to an extent. And a, a lot of people actually thought I was an alcoholic. So I kind of got away with it, it was strange. But if you do, if anyone in the audience here tonight, you have family, you have friends, that, that struggling with addiction issues as well. I think it's important to know that it's not really the drugs or the drink that's the problem, it's the underlying issues. That's what, where the problem actually lies and that's what you need to sort out. So in the end, I stopped functioning anyway and it was around 2013, it was August 2013 and I lost everything. I lost my health, I lost my job, I lost my mind and I lost every important relationship in my life. I drove everyone away from me. And for me, it was time to sink or swim. It was time to live or die. I think I was nearly dead, to be quite honest. My body was giving up. And I decided for the first time to seek professional help. So I, um, I went to a, the clinic where I was in and I wanted to get into a detox center. But I couldn't actually get into the detox center. I'd, um, I, I was an insurance risk, believe it or not. Too many drugs in my system. So I was forced to do a detox at home on my own. And talking about anti-fragile and turning negatives into positives, two days into that home detox was not only the most painful night of my life, it was also the most important night of my life. I woke up on my sitting room floor, covered in blood, my face covered in blood. And what had actually happened, I had a convulsive seizure. I don't know if any of you know what a convulsive seizure is, but it's when every cell in your body, in your brain fires at the same time. It's like a cascading effect of just like fire going through your brain, firing at the same time. And it activates every single cell in your brain. So you feel all the muscles convulsing in your, in your body and you feel all the, all the senses in your body all firing at the same time. So what had actually happened to me was I dro I'd driven my teeth through my tongue. That's where the blood was actually coming from. And my poor brother who was in the room, he's seen it all. He was ringing my dad and thought I was dead, because apparently a slump at the end of a seizure. So he thought I was dead, ringing my dad saying, Brian's dead. And fortunately I wasn't, anyway. And um, I was rushed to the hospital anyway. And my family, after all the hassle I gave them all them years, they rallied around me. Did you know what, they never actually left me. They were always backing me, especially my dad, who's here tonight. And, but he really rallied around me that night. And my sister paints a real picture when she arrived at the hospital. She remembers getting to the hospital and she says, I was lying on a trolley or sitting on a trolley or something like that. And she says, I was like a, something from a wax museum. Like there was like a waxy, waxy skin with a layer of grease on top. And all she wanted to do was like comfort me or give me a hug. But she was actually afraid to touch my skin in case, in case my skin would break away. She was saying it was like waxy, soft, grey putty. Now I have no idea what I looked like. But a few hours later, my first memory at a hospital, I remember waking up in a hospital trolley and I remember how I felt. I was physically, emotionally, and mentally broken. 
uh, the, the image of that hospital, it's actually Blanchetown Hospital, it's only a few minutes away from here. And the, the image, it's ingrained in my brain, which is kind of a good thing because it brings me back so I won't go back to the last state of where I was. But I remember just trying to get up off the trolley, lean up off the trolley. And I remember looking at the walls. It's just born into my brain, this imagery is. And the walls were like orange, like browny orange colour. And it was dim in the room. I remember there was a light flickering in the background. I remember hearing noises out in the corridor, like Mormons or kids crying or something like that. But it was the smell that I'll never forget. It was like this disinfectant-like smell, sickly sweet, with the smell of vomit as well. And with the taste of blood in my mouth as well, I was just, I remember just feeling nauseous. But I tried to get up off the trolley, and I, I couldn't. I, I was just nearly, uh, my body was just giving way. And I just started to sat up and just started to slump there. And my eyes fixated on a fire extinguisher. I knew it was a fire extinguisher. And I knew it was red. But I remember it was like tunnel vision and I started just trying to focus on it. But it wasn't a red fire extinguisher, not to me. I couldn't put the words together. And I remember looking around the rest of the room saying the tiles on the floor and the colours and nothing would go together. It was like words didn't connect anymore. And I remember just sitting back to myself thinking, oh, wow, man, you're fucked, you're, you're brain damaged. That's it, game over. Something like that would have sent the old me into an absolute frenzy. I suffered with panic attacks, I suffered with anxiety, I just suffered with fear, to be quite honest. Always in fear. But I remember that moment I just said, oh, do you know what, I have no more fight, I don't care. I just couldn't fight anymore and I just gave up, I just surrendered. For me, that was the most important point ever in my life. It was the first time in my life I stopped fighting my mind, fighting to keep my addiction, fighting to keep that tortured voice, the narrative inside of my head, what I had to do. I just gave up. And that was the opening for me just to completely change my life. It was, um, I went, um, I came back from the hospital um, that night and I had to spend another five weeks at home. They, they were the, five of the most painful weeks in my life. And that was, I think I just surrendered more in my house. I had a couple more seizures and it was just the most painful few weeks in my life. Then I went to a detox facility. I was finally, most of the drugs were in my system. There was just opiates in my system. So I was allowed to go to the detox facility. I had another five painful weeks in there coming off opiates, coming off heroin. But when I was two days clean, all the drugs out of my system, the fire extinguisher incident, that stopped me fighting. But when I was two days clean, something remarkable happened, that happened to me. What I like to say is that for the first time in my life, I fully contacted reality. When I'm talking about contacting reality, I'm talking about sensory experiences getting out of my head and getting into reality. If I flick that match right now, flick it on here now, I'd smell the sulfur, I'd hear the wood crackling, I'd feel the heat, and I'd feel the orange, or see the orange flames. If you guys are sitting now, you're listening to my voice, you might feel your feet on the ground, you might feel your back on the sea. That's what I mean by contact and reality. But if you're sitting there and you're worried about what happened last week, or you're concerned about work tomorrow, or all these worries going on, you're not in reality. And that's where I lived all my life, tormented. But this created an opening where I was just grounded in the present moment. A key part of this, what happened to me as well was that I dropped the story that I told myself. My story was, you have anxiety, you have to do drugs, it's the only way you can cope with the world. But I dropped the story, I dropped the narrative and I dropped the thinking and everything changed. I remember sitting out in the detox facility and the, the morning that happened, it was two, two days in, I'll never forget it, and I was sitting on a fence. And it was an October dew-soaked morning and I was sitting on the fence. And I remember Molly, the cat on the, on the farm, it was on a farm, the detox facility was on a farm. And Molly crawled up my leg and I remember the claws digging into my leg, it was like a grey feeling, it was just like really alive. And I remember the sun coming up from behind the trees and everything was just glowing. Greens were greener. The sounds of the birds just sounded amazing. It was like I hadn't heard them in years. And just the breeze, the, the mist in the air and the colours and the sounds and the smells, everything was just amazing. And what I've come to learn was, 
when I stopped being consumed by my mind and I stopped that thinking, that left the space to be able to contact reality, to be in the present moment. And by grounding myself in the present moment, that's where my life completely changed. There's a couple of things that, that really changed for me when I, because I was able to ground myself in the present moment. I don't put limits on myself anymore. I do honestly believe anything is possible. It's given me the ambition to dream big and to be bold. But more so, it's because I don't worry anymore. I don't worry about the future. I could have made a mess of this talk tonight, but you know what? It's not really that big a deal. Only in my head. That's, it's only a big deal in my head. That's the only place where it's really, where it's really gonna be a problem. But what being grounded in the present moment has given me, I laugh at rejection, I embrace failure, and I take big risks. But it's all from being grounded in the present moment. By doing that in the last five and a half years, my life has completely changed. I could have, a lot of people are telling me I should just get a job similar to what I was doing, or I should just do this, but it says, no, I want, to, I want to take a big risk and I want to completely change. So I went back to college and I got a degree in psychology. Then I said, you know what, I want, to get a P I want to do a PhD. And I got a scholarship to do my PhD. Then I said, you know what, I want to do a bit of lecturing. So I started to chance my arm at doing a bit of lecturing. Now I'm a lecturer in UCD and a lecturer in Trinity College. That's how I met Noel Breslin, actually, first off for the book. And, uh, uh, yeah, I teach the neuroscience of mindfulness and the neuroscience of addiction there. But then I took it even a step further. Last year, I think it's about a year and a half ago now, and I decided to reach out to some of the most successful people in Ireland. I want to share tools and tactics that they've learned and share them with other people. That's, that's probably my whole mission. I want to write another book on that as well. But what that's turned out to for me was, is mentorships with some of the most successful CEOs in Ireland. I was only interviewing celebrities last week and they're giving me connections and the ability to get, to get, do talks like this. Like it's unbelievable. And the thing is, if you don't ask, you don't get. But it's our minds that stop us asking for these things. Oh, what will they think of me? Say if they say no. But by being able, grounded in the present moment and not fearing these things, not fearing your own mind, you can just take big risks. As I said, you can dream big and you can be bold. A um, couple of weeks ago there as well, I signed a book contract. So it's true the book with Noel, that fell through, but I got my own book deal. And as soon as I got that book deal, I said, you know what, I want to do something else. I'd love to get a TV show. Like the cheek of it, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> it really is cheeky. But I got onto Virgin Media. I'm not even sure if any of them are here tonight. I hope not. <laughs> but uh, I got onto Virgin Media and I said, you know what, I'd love to do my own TV show about progression. And I'll talk about my own story. But I want to share the tools and tactics that I'm going to be talking about soon with people. And I really think I can capture people's imagination. I've since sent the TV proposal in there. They're very, very keen, and I'm, I'm in talks about getting my own TV show on Virgin Media, just by taking a risk and being bold. There's a quote that, um, <laughs> cheers. There's a quote that I heard a couple of years ago, about three years ago now, by Tim Ferriss. He's a personal growth expert in America, and it had a huge impact on my life. And it goes something like this. 99% of people are convinced that they are incapable of great things and therefore aim for mediocrity. Paradoxically, that makes mediocrity, realistic goals, the most competitive field. 99% of people are aiming for the same things. So why not be the 1%? It's much easier to be the 1%. <laughs> I, I was the only ex-addict out there that was going out to CEOs and celebrities asking them for an interview. That's a fact. I think so, anyway. So, just something to say, to think a, think a little bit different. Because you know what, it's much easier to jump out of the fishbowl than it is to live in it. There's, uh, it's like we're going, going to the cinema, isn't it? <laughs> Watching it in email. There's something I want to get across as well now. And I'm going to be talking about tools and tactics that I've used in my own life. And some of you might be sitting there, well, we didn't have that experience in detox, whatever the hell happened to me, that shift that I had. But what's important to know is that two years into me being clean, it's about three and a half years ago, 
I got consumed by college. I went back to college and I got consumed by it again. I wanted to do really well and I was studying too much, which isn't all that bad. But I was getting caught up in the social world again and my mind was getting busy again. And I remember just realising one day, it was like it came to a shock to me and I says, wow, I've lost that lovely life feeling that I had, that, that I carried from, from, from recovery. And I couldn't believe it. And what really shocked me was that it happened in unawareness. I remember I was, I was nearly going off to Tibet or to Nepal just to meditate for the rest of my life. That's, that was honestly what was in my mind. But I was convinced, I was, somebody was telling me just now double down on what you're doing and just focus on your mental health force. So that's what I done. I got good advice off somebody. And what I done then was I, st I developed a, a practice. I call it my program for life that I've developed for myself, for my own life. And that's what I share with my clients and share with my talks. But I've doubled down on that practice. And I'm even 10 times better now because of that practice than I was when I started off after detox. So just some of these tools that I'm going to be talking about, it's, it's not because of the shift I had. It's the tools that I use that make me so happy. I genuinely am one of the happiest people I know and the most positive people I know. And it is because of these tools. So I just want to get that across that it, you can, with consistent effort, you can implement these tools and you can work for, work for anybody. So I want to start off with a little story about two little fish swimming in the sea. And you're swimming along, and al along comes this older, wiser fish. And he looks at the little fish and he says, how's it going, lads? How's the water? So the two little fish smile, nod, and swim on their way. A couple of minutes later, they're swimming along in the water, and one of the little fish turns around to the other one and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> and this is a really important parable. This, this had a huge impact on me, because the fact is, Sometimes some of the most obvious and important realities are the most difficult to see. I didn't know I was consumed by my mind. I really didn't. I only know it since I got out of it. Everybody has that voice in their head, that inner voice that never, ever, ever stops. And that's what determines our behavior. If there's anyone sitting there saying to themselves, I don't have that inner voice, guess who told you that? <laughs> it's there. It's there all the time, and we can't even see it. It really is. The, f the fourth tool that I want to talk about, it's about first and second darts. And, and this is a quote that I just live by myself, and it's like, your mind is a, an amazing tool, but it can trick you very, very easily. So what I always say to myself, if there's a conflict between my gut and my mind, I always go with my gut, because the mind can play tricks on you. There's a Buddhist metaphor that I love that I use all the time. It's probably one of the most important tools that I practice. And it's based on first and second darts. First darts are the darts that life throws at us. It's, it, they cause us pain. But pain is inevitable. If you live in love, you will experience pain in life. People will pass away at some stage. You might lose your job. Your child might get hurt. You might go out tonight and you might have a puncher. My car could be gone for all I know. That's, that's life. It, things happen. You don't know what's going to happen. They're forced darts. They're the darts that life throws at us. But that's not where suffering comes from. Suffering comes from the darts that we throw at ourselves. So an example of this might be, you might go home later in the week, or tonight even, and your partner or a family member might turn around to you, be, be in, a, in a bad mood, and they might just trigger you and say, what did you do that for? Something might have gone on. Forced darts. If you live in love, you're going to experience forced darts. But what might happen then? You might react and get angry. Second dart. You might then have a big fight. Another second dart. Then you might go upstairs, feel guilty because you got angry. Another second dart. Then you feel depressed because you got guilty because you were angry. Another second dart. Wake up the next day, still in a bad mood, probably don't even know why. Go into work and have a fight with someone in work. Another second dart. And some people live in this eternal second dart nature. There's just always dart, 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 dart. But you can stop them second darts. And the key to doing that is, so you're not living, swimming around the ocean like a fish looking for the water. You've got to be aware of your own mind, aware of the thoughts that are going on in your head. The best way to do this, and the practice I use, I'm not going to talk about mindfulness or meditation tonight. But meditation is the tool. I'm just going to, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But meditation is the tool to build self-awareness so you can catch them second darts. 
I'm not, as I was saying, I'm not going to go into the depths of meditation, and, and, and it's overcomplicated in my eyes anyway. But the essence of meditation is catching that mad mind of yours, of ours, of everyone's. Catching yourself being unaware and bringing it back to the present moment. If I was to do a mindfulness exercise with us right now, and I'd say, let's do a five minute breathing exercise, focus on the breath, we'd be focusing on the breath. But all of a sudden then, the mind comes in and it starts planning, thinking, worrying, all of these kinds of thoughts. The idea of meditation isn't to sit in a room all zen for 20 minutes, that's not the nature of it at all. The idea of meditation is catching that internal chatter and bringing it back to the breath, or bringing it back to anything you do mindfully. And if you keep on doing that, you're literally practicing catching your thoughts, practicing catching second darts. And the more you practice that, when you're in the real world, the easier it will be to catch those second darts that can go out of control and just ruin your day, ruin your life, to be quite honest. So what I'm, trying, what I'm saying here is, is to build some kind of meditation practice in your life. Meditation for me, or contact and reality even, it doesn't even have to be meditation or mindfulness, it's just contact and reality, catching your thoughts and bringing it back to the present moment. That's all it is at the end of the day. But the more you practice that, the more you will reduce second arts. There's a great quote, it's probably my favourite quote, by a guy called Viktor Frankl. He wrote it, he was an Auschwitz survivor, he survived all the concentration camps, an amazing person, an amazing book he wrote as well. And he, for me, he captures the essence of the fruits of meditation. And the quote goes like this, between stimulus and a response, there is a space. In that space is your chance to choose that response. And there lies your growth and your freedom. The more you practice some kind of meditation into your life, or the more you just practice being self, being more aware, you can even be mindful brushing your teeth or walking up the stairs. You can be mindful doing anything. You really can. It doesn't have to be a form of meditation practice. But the more you practice that, the better you get at opening up that space between stimulus and response, and you will stop them second darts. The fact of the matter is, pain is inevitable, force darts. But suffering is optional, second darts. You can stop them second darts and you can stop suffering. The next thing I want to talk about, the next tool I want to talk about is, um, this has probably had the biggest impact in my life above all other tools. Meditation is involved in it as well. And it's basically a morning routine. Most people start off the day, an alarm goes off. They jump out of bed, they rush to work, they might grab a coffee on their way. They probably have an argument with their boss while they're in the shower. That's the essence of it. And that's how a lot of people start their day, anxious, running, flying, all this kind of stuff. If you start your day like that, how is the rest of your day gonna go? The morning routine is the most important, or the morning is the most important part of your day to set your intentions for the day. So I take 20 minutes every single morning, without fail, every single morning, and I've developed a morning routine. My morning routine is made up of meditation, affirmations, visualization, inner child work, and gratitude. It's an acronym I have, it's called MAVIC. I don't do it in that order, I do meditation last, but Avigam just doesn't have that same ring to it. <laughs> so I just go with MAVIC. But I've, I've already talked about meditation, so straight away then off the bat I'll do affirmations. And an affirmation is simply just a statement, just a verbal statement of setting your intentions. I keep mine very simple and I simply just say, I am positive, happy, energetic and carefree. I am positive, happy, energetic and carefree. And I'll just say that about 15 times. Our brains are actually not as clever as you think. It believes the language, it really does. And affirmations can be very, very, very powerful. The next thing I do is visualization. I have a couple of different visualization techniques. But what, what I'll basically do is I'll visualize myself being strong, visualize myself feeling healthy, eating healthy, working out, all of these kind of just very healthy habits. And I visualize that. I've often visualized myself writing my second book over in Bali or over in the Alps. But when I'm visualising that, I don't just be visualising it, I'd be feeling it. I can smell the coffee on the balcony over in the Alps. I can smell the pine leaves on the trees. 
I can feel the sun on my back as I'm crawling up the mountain in the afternoon. I get really into the visualization and I really, really feel it. Even this morning, I was doing my visualization practice and I was sitting there and I was visualizing how this talk was gonna go. And I was saying, I'll be confident, I'll be emotive. And you want to see the standing ovation I got. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> But an important point about visual <laughs> an important point about visualization as well is that it has to be things you can act towards. So I hear some people saying they visualize winning the lotto. But I can't you can't act towards winning the lottery. If I visualize being over in the Alps or being confident doing a talk, I can take actions that align with that. If I get an opportunity throughout the day that will bring me closer to the Alps, I'll take that opportunity because I'm visualizing that stuff. And that's the real power of visualization. The next part of my morning routine will be inner child work. And inner child work is really, really powerful. I still get anxious doing talks, not, not as much as I used to, but I still feel the anxiety in my body before the start of a talk. But it's not Brian standing here now that's anxious. It's the old me that was anxious all my life. The child that got anxious, the child that had trauma in his life, that's who's feeling the anxiety. Because it's in your, in your muscles, that memory's in your muscles, them, them feelings are in your muscles. So when I feel anxious, it's the old child. So what the inner child work really is, is visualizing your young self and just sort of be soothing to the young child. I often visualize my eight-year-old child who has suffered from anxiety and I just nearly give him a hug or just say everything's okay. I remember I used to be mad into football at that age and I used to build these goalposts out the back and put a blanket on the back for a net. It was way before the day when we had nets. <laughs> and I just, I'd be out the back, visualizing out the back garden, helping that eight year old kid, just saying everything's okay. I used to think this was really fluffy stuff, but it's come, I've come to believe that this is a really, really powerful practice. And it only takes me a minute, just a quick visualization. The last part of that is gratitude. Practicing gratitude. Gratitude has possibly become the most important practice in my life. It's such a powerful state to be in. You can't be resentful, you can't be angry, you can't be jealous while you're being grateful. You really can't. It's such an important practice. I, I, I sometimes have gratitude lists and stuff like that. But what I've practiced recently is, or what I tried to do pretty recently is, is I go in really deep on one little aspect of gratitude. An example of this would be, my little nephew, he's only two years of age, he's the cutest little smile. I wouldn't be in his life if I was still in addiction, that's a fact. So I think of his little smile and I say, I'm grateful for the joy that his little smile brings to me. Then I'll think, I'm grateful for the joy that Aaron's smile brings to my sister and her husband and how it brings that family together. I'm grateful for the joy that his little smile brings me mom and dad when they mind them during the week. And I just go deep on one specific thing. Gratitude can be really, really powerful. There's another aspect of the morning routine as well. Two little things that I want to say as well is, and especially the visualization parts. When I've, as I mentioned already, I teach neuroscience in a, of mindfulness and addiction, but I know neuroscience pretty well. When you're practicing visualization, it's not just this fluffy concept that might do you good. If I, I'm enjoying this talk and I'm really enjoying this talk and the visual center of my brain would literally be firing dopamine now. It's like pleasure, the pleasure center of my brain and it's making me feel good. And wherever I am, when I'm in the Alps, that'd be the same, that'd be happening as well. But when you're actually visualizing something, the same neurons fire and the same dopamine is released into your brain. So before I even leave my room in the morning, I am getting a biological injection of, of positive, I was going to say morphine, of <laughs> a biological injection of positivity <laughs> into me life before I even leave my room. And the thing that some people say to me is that they haven't got time to do a morning routine. And I, I, I can understand where that's coming from. But the fact of the matter is that morning routines don't take time, they make time. It takes me 20 minutes to do my morning routine. And the metaphor I use for that is, it's like I'm starting off in a race, 
400 metre race, there's eight or nine of us in the blocks. The gun goes off, everyone starts running, but I'm stuck in the blocks. Not stuck in the blocks, I'm sitting in the blocks, preparing myself for the race. But I get myself set, do my morning routine, metaphorically speaking, and then I go, 50 yards, the olive head start on me. After 100 yards, I'm getting closer. I'm energized, I'm focused, I'm attentive. 150 yards, I'm right behind them, but I'm getting stronger. 200 yards, still focused, still full of positivity, still energized. But what the other people in the race who started off the alarm clock, started off anxious and all of these different things, they're having a dip in energy. And you'd easily lose two to three hours in the day from that. But if you start your morning off in the right way, energized, it gives you energy throughout the whole day and it gives you back so many hours throughout the whole day. Morning routines don't take time, they make time. There's another thing that, the last tool that I really want to talk about and cover is um, a lot of people are overwhelmed, I think, and a lot of people will be asking me about anxiety and stuff like that. And it's people, so many people are struggling with anxiety and overwhelm and all of these kinds of things. And preventative measures are great, a morning routine is great, building self-awareness is great. But something that we have to do, and it's very practical is, is literally just reduce the amount of overwhelm we have in our lives. And that's where it's very important to get clarity in your life and have an ability, a way of saying yes and saying no, a clear way of making decisions in your life. The first one, the first step of a decision-making framework that I've developed for myself, and it's a mantra by a guy called Derek Sivers. I'm actually hoping to meet him soon over the summer. He's an amazing guy from America. And his mantra goes like this, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And it's that simple. That's the first step. You can't use it for everything, but you can use it for a lot of things. So when I'm faced with a decision in the day, I'll say, is it hell yeah? If it is, I do it. If it's not, I don't. So if it's the gut is just screaming, do it, yeah, I do it. If it's not, I don't. I do it with right. And if I have a paragraph that I'm not mad on, I'll say, is it hell yeah? If it is, I go with it. If it's not, I don't. It just gives me ability, an ability to cut things out in my life really, really quickly. But obviously, life is more complex than that. And we can't, can't be all about hell yes and a no. <laughs> so that's, that's why I've, did, I've come up with this tool. Does it make the boat go faster? This was a system that the Great Britain Round Team used, a mantra, a decision-making tool that the Great British Round Team used for the 2000 Olympics. Basically, when they were faced with a decision in the build-up to the Olympics, they simply asked, them, asked themselves, will it make the boat go faster? They were talking about their round boat. So if they were, let's say, asked to go out for a meal, a heavy pasta meal or something, and a drink of wine, they'd say, will it make the boat go faster? If it did, they said yes. If it didn't, they said no. So I have started to develop this mantra into it and I developed a metaphorical bow for myself that's based on my purpose, my values and my goals. My goals in life is my book, my PhD and my speaking career. So if I'm faced with a decision, I'll simply scan my goals and say, will it make the boat go faster? If it does, I say yes. If it doesn't, I say no. My purpose in life, I suppose my mission in life is with a relentless belief that we are what we think, because we are what we think, we really are. I want to show people that change is possible, demonstrating actionable steps through a lived experience. So I'm living my purpose right now. That's why I said yes, that's why I wanted to do this talk. If I was asked to do a school talk, I'd say yeah, that makes me purpose go faster, so I'd say yes. But I'd just ask, does it make my boat go faster? But it's not all about my goals, my purpose, or my agenda. And as I was saying, life is complex. So that's where values come in. So I'm very clear on my values. I've reflected on my values. Some of my values include being bold, connection, compassion, accountability, I do what I say, open-mindedness. And I have a couple of values that I've, I've thought about. And basically when I'm faced with a decision, I'll scan my values. If I'm stuck, if it's not clear cut, and it's, it's fighting between my goals and my purpose and my gut feeling of saying, oh, you need to spend more time with family or friends. I'll scan my values and I'll see, does it align with my values? Does it make the boat go faster for my values? And then I base my decision on that. So what I'd say to you here tonight is, because I'd say a lot of people here might be coming from a mental health perspective or 
Do you want to help other people in their, in their lives that with mental health issues? You could have a think of a metaphorical bow for yourself. Let's say our goal might be better mental health, reduce anxiety. They're your goals. You could use two, a tool or one of the tools from this talk tonight. They're your goals. You could have a think about your values. Your values might be honesty, kindness, loyalty. Honesty to yourself, that's the big one. I wake up every day and say, how am I deceiving myself today? Because we're very good at deceiving ourselves, we really are. And you might have a think then about your purpose, it might be your family. So if you're faced with a decision, let's say go for a few drinks or something like that, and it's okay to drink, obviously, but you might just ask yourself, am I lying to myself? Will it make the relationship with the family go faster? Will it make my mental health go faster? Will it make the boat, my boat, go faster? So just reflect on your own boat, develop your own boat, and it's just a simple decision-making tactic you can use really, really quickly of things that you've thought deeply about. You can take it further. The, the, some, some of the companies that I've done talks for, they've actually developed this now into, into, the company, into the companies and into the departments and the goals and the values of the department and they ask themselves, does it make our boat go faster? So you can fix that boat or them values to any sort of boat that you want to make, it, make them decisions. I'm going to, I'm going to take you, a couple of, I'm going to do a takeaway uh, messages at the end and one other slide, but I'm just going to take a couple of questions from the audience if anyone has any questions. I'd be delighted to take some. <laughs> we have a panic attack now if no one asks a question. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Hi. Liam. Oh, Liam, hi, how are you? Very interesting. What else goes your life? How do you deal with anxiety now? Um, there's, it's a couple of things, so preventative measures, the morning routine, but the main thing of that would be a form of mindfulness that I practice is like sort of self-observation, that would be my key tool for anxiety these days. So for anxiety is different for everyone, anxiety for me is in my chest, it's around my chest and there's tight feelings in my chest and if I talk about my heartbeat I, I can feel anxiety building inside of me. And the, the practice that I do is just like self-observation. So instead of, I used to always say, I am anxiety. That I thought I owned anxiety. I had a royal kind of anxiety, much worse than anyone else's anxiety. That's, the way, that's honestly the way I thought. And, but the, the key point was, I am anxiety. I connected, I associated myself with being anxiety. But what I do now is, I observe anxiety. So it's something that passes through me. There's a great metaphor that I use for that. And it's like clouds floating through the sky. Sometimes they're dark, angry clouds, that's like the anxiety, and bodily sensations, but it could be dark thoughts or dark feelings, and they come in. But everything comes and everything goes. Everything will pass at some stage, good and bad. So I literally just observe them bodily sensations, observe them feelings as the dark clouds that are gonna come and go. I'll be, I see myself as like the observer in that practice, as the blue sky observing the clouds. And that's a really, really powerful practice, just to, it's, you, you disassociate yourself from the anxiety and you just become the observer of the anxiety rather than being the anxiety. And it takes practice and it's difficult, it's not easy. But with practice, you, can just, you, you just create that disconnection and it's, it's a powerful practice. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Um, well, for the, um, for the boat one, that they seem to be very keen on that. In the corporate world, I've had a, their, their department, I'd say I've done a couple of talks in AIB. So the values of AIB would be like empowerment, keeping it simple. So they, if they were to use that metaphorical boat, their values would be the values that stand for that company. Their goals might be to be the most uh, customer obsessed, that's the market team of AIB, the most um, customer obsessed team in Ireland. So that's their goal. So when they'd say, if they had a decision to make, they'd say, will it make the boat go faster? Will that make us being the most customer obsessed team in Ireland? Will it make that go faster? So that's the one thing that, that really, really works. Um, a lot of the tools that I discuss in the corporate world, I discuss mental models, creative thinking stuff as well. But I've done a lot around force and second arts. Like at the end of the day, self-awareness is the holy grail. Like without self-awareness, nothing works. Like values don't matter if you have no self-awareness because you're not going to align with your values anyway. So I try to do a lot of stuff around self-awareness and building emotional intelligence. And 
mindfulness sort of gets, it's sort of people are sort of saying, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Mindfulness is everywhere. And it's sort of people aren't taking it as seriously as they should. But mindfulness or some kind of meditation practice is the key to self-awareness. And once you build that, then everything just gets better. Mental health gets better. Like people don't even like talking about mental health issues. But for me, I work on my mental health, not because I struggle with my mental health anymore. I make my mental health even much better because I perform at a much higher level. So it's the foundations of high performance. And that's what I'd be really bringing into the corporate world. <laughs> Sorry, just going back to what you said about um, anxiety there and the, the dark clouds and observing your past. And, um, if you're in a situation, for example, a performance situation or a work situation on that come and you don't, you are actually on your, your inmost or your, you're supposed to be doing something <laughs> and that you can't uh, kind of stop right so and this is where the preventative measures come in like the, the one thing about this is there's no quick fix yeah. so even if you you said from tomorrow right, i'm going to start doing this if you start doing it once you're triggered in a difficult event that's going to be very very difficult my first uh, talk that i done it would have been about a year and a half ago and i done it in national college of ireland and i thought it was going to be grand flying into this talk and I started, and my mouth went dry, and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a panic attack. And that's what it felt like, it honestly did. But because of the practice of self-observation and the practice of mindfulness that I'd already been employing in my life, it was like I just came out of myself. So it was the preventative measures beforehand, like the, the work I'd done beforehand, it was like I just came out of myself and just observed myself and says, right, it'll be okay, take a drink of water focus on the questions and I was just able to bring myself back so it was like automated for me what I found through through the practice and in the next slide I'm going to really be talking about the importance of consistency through the practice of always putting the practice in it just becomes automated and when you're put under them stressful situations the, the habits kick in and it's just something that you do automatically one more question yeah hi Annie how are you To me, what I'm hearing is you're talking about this is an everyday piece. So when these moments come, we're ready. What I'm also curious about is the yin and the yang of this, because although this work is purposeful and it makes you happy, when you want to just chill, what do you do? <laughs> I was hoping no one was going to ask that question. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's me Achilles heel. <laughs> to be quite honest, I could easily say, and I've said this before, I could easily say I'm addicted to this stuff, like, to be quite honest. And I do find it hard to turn off, but at the same time, do I want to turn off? It's, um, this is something I'm struggling with, whether I want it or not. Like, this stuff energizes me. So do I want to turn off? But not everyone is sort of in the same, doing the same stuff that, that, that like the personal growth world. So it is a little bit different, but definitely, and, and balance is one of my values. A couple of my values I value, but I don't align myself to them. But, and I was, I was reading something recently about the pendulum and the pendulum going back and forward, back and forward. And it is just a metaphor at the end of the day, the yin and the yang, and it's deep Eastern philosophies and they're thousands of years old. But for me personally, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and I just always feel up from the practice. So it doesn't feel like there's a pendulum. In fairness now, there is ebbs and flows. Like even yesterday I was feeling a bit, a bit low, not low, but it would have been just not as, just a little bit tired. So I just started to say, right, I'll just chill. I watched a couple of friends actually I did. So it's nearly just, just chill with it. But I do struggle to chill. It's like um, my mind, because, I, because I'm so disciplined with the, that mindset and I'm always practicing, it'd be like planning. You need to get back to work. You need to do this, you need to do that. So it, that's one of my, that honestly is one of my challenges at the moment. So. You do have to have balance and you do have to chill, but it's um, yeah, it's 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 a tough one. It, that that's a tough one. So, but it's like for me as well. It's uh, I I and, and everyone's different. This is the key piece as well. There's individual differences. Everybody is different at the end of the day. I can't moderate. 
if I moderate, if I take a little bit of a shortcut, I tend to go big and I need to start to keep me discipline on a very high level. But some people are a little bit different, so it's important to take that into account, take them individual differences into account as well. Cheers. So I'll just finish on the last slide before the takeaway. <clears throat> and the, the important piece is, for me, and this is, the, this is the message that I really try to get across to everyone, and it's that action, action, action is so important. But the most important piece is consistency. I always say that most people don't act. And if you act, you'll shine. But if you act consistently, you'll be unstoppable. You really will. It's that consistency is absolutely key. Consistency, consistency, consistency. And I often talk to some people and you see they go to, um, they go to motivational talks. They might read a book and they'd be buzzing after the book and they start acting on New Year's resolution and they start putting the action in. But the metaphor I was thinking of, it's like climbing Mount Everest. And a lot of people act and they put the action in for January or something like that. But they get the base camp and then they stop. But the key part is, is to just keep on going. Keep on putting one foot after the other. And even start small, baby steps. If you're running a marathon, it's one step after another all the time. Baby steps, just one step after another. So if you're going home from this talk tonight and you're thinking about making changes, do one minute of mindfulness, two minutes of mindfulness. Read an inspirational blog. Have a think about one value. Just baby steps and bring it in. So, but act, that's the key piece, but you've got to stay consistent. You really have to stay consistent and you've got to be disciplined for a while. But what happens after, when you build that discipline, for, I think some of the research says 20 days, the real research actually says 66 days to build a habit. But you just need to stay disciplined for that amount of time. But then it just becomes a habit. You don't get up in the morning and say, oh, I have to brush my teeth, oh, I have to get dressed. We just do it, they're habits. And for me, from pushing through that barrier, I just get up in the morning and I just brush my teeth, I do my morning routine, it's just part of the habit. But the metaphor I'm talking about is, most people stop at base camp and they don't go past base camp. But if you go past base camp and you just keep on walking up that mountain, stay disciplined, it actually gets easier. And although we're always on a journey and it never ends, unlike getting to the top of Everest, I suppose, the, the goal, the, the, the value at the top, the gains that you get when you keep on going, you keep on being consistent, are astronomical. Thanks very much. <laughs> that was a cue, trigger. <laughs>